Hey everybody, how's it going? This is uh, Rick Burnett here with James Clark from Erogenous Tones. And uh, today we want to do, uh, this is our first talk ever on structure. And um, we want to do a talk about the origin of how we even got to the point of making structure and uh, follow that up with where we think we're going to be going with structure in the future. So, you know, graphic design is our passion. Couldn't, couldn't help when I saw this meme a few days ago uh, demonstrating uh, my love for art. But this is also, you know, in case any of this is rough, uh, you know, this is our first time doing something like this. So just a heads up on that. Mm. So uh, to, to start this off, what I figured we'd do is um, have James go through, uh, you know, what is structure? Because if some of you here haven't had a chance to uh, see it or play around with it, figured a quick demo of, of some of the things it can do and just a little bit of the features it have before we get into some of the other things we want to talk about. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to try to not talk too fast or run too long. Expect Rick to interrupt me if I go uh, too far in either direction. So, um, Structure is a visual generator module that Rick and I developed over the course of a, uh, you know, over about three years or so, and, and you know, the later talk will be about the evolution of that. But to give you just the real quick uh, rundown of what structure is, here we have the module. We do CVBS input and, out, um, and output, and we also take in LZX one volt video inputs. We have five CV to our audio rate, and um, sorry, we have C3 three gates and five CV, two audio rate, inputs to structure. We also have a display screen where we can see what's going on uh, being sent to the output, as well as uh, various node sets. And the basic concept of structure is built on the idea of a node that generates video or that affects the video process. In this particular patch that we're seeing right now, uh, we have a generator and two effects. Um, because of the digital nature of structure, we can save presets. Come over here a little bit, oh. just uh, having a little trouble hearing you. Oh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> just so we have a um, kind of give an overview of some of the things that structure can do, uh, we've saved some presets here that I'd like to use uh, and then kind of quickly discuss what we're seeing in each of them. So the first one is just the basic generator. Uh, the second preset here will be showing um, basically when we're doing effects and scan lines. I think we just went off the preset menu. We sure did. There we go. Sorry. Um, structure can also use things like images and have effects put on the images. We can use these images and multiple uh, you know, effects. Here we can use the controls to modify the parameters of the various nodes, which can be done through CV or can also be done through MIDI input. Uh, another preset here. Uh, here we're using our rasterized module and we even have the joystick map to be able to kind of rotate this around in the space. Uh, we also have 3D object shapes and here we have a 3D object where the vertices, the, uh, the, the points of each of the uh, triangles that make up the 3D shape are being modulated by a shader and then we're throwing that through uh, a tune animation effect uh, and again we can modify, we have controls over a lot of different aspects uh, of, this, of this patch. Um, another preset here, we're using the feedback knob so we can actually intercept our own output and we can modulate the feedback and the amount of feedback coming in. And then we have that on the joystick as well. So it can, it can do feedback amongst itself and uh, then go to another real quick. Um, and so here, and this is a little darker than I was hoping, we actually have a 3D object and see my hand moving in the other screen. We have a camera, so we have a live video feed coming into structure. And actually if I bounce out of preset, we can dial back to just the video feed through effects. Yeah, that camera you're using is just a little dark. Yeah, that, that is a little bit of a dark camera. Um, and one or two more points, another thing we have within structure. There's another 3D object because I was really enjoying that, that shape. Um, we also have video clips. So now we're seeing a video clip playing in the background. Here, let me speed that up. We have a video clip playing in the background, and then my video camera of my hand over the structure here uh, is being filtered, uh, is having effect applied to it, and then we're mixing them on top of each other all within uh, structure. And I think 
where did I put the, the, the last one I wanted to show? Oh, and then here, uh, we also have a text module, which can use true type fonts and display um, files word by word, letter by letter, line by line. Um, and a lot of these, let me see here, let me pull out of this. Uh, we have different ways that the text can be presented. So here, I'm hitting a random button, and we're just going to go through different fonts uh, and different display methods. And modify some of these parameters here. And uh, I mean, that's kind of yeah. a qu quick overall of what Structure can do. Obviously, on the website, we have some more in-depth information and full manual and all that other stuff. You're fully welcome to use Comic Sans if you'd like. <laughs> it supports it. All right, so um, you know, one thing we wanted to talk about, we get this question a lot from people is, is how did you ever conceptualize coming up with structure in the first place? So I think the first place to start is kind of like back in the beginning of how we each got into visuals. So I will say that um, before I met James, um, you know, I had come across a lot of demo scene graphics and uh, had played a, a lot, around a lot with uh, Milk Drop and Winamp, and I absolutely loved what it could do, but hated that I couldn't influence it. And then, you know, I, I didn't really do anything beyond that other than uh, when I was in college, I studied advanced graphics programming as my minor. Um, so got into OpenGL and stuff like that, but then went off into engineering. So, so didn't do a lot with it until I met James. And I'm going to let James talk about how he got started since, since mine really comes out of when I met him probably around 2001-ish, I think. That sounds about right. Um, and we started working on some, some stuff together, uh, you know, mostly music at the time. And he was like, hey, let me show you some graphic stuff that I have. So uh, go ahead. Where we bumped into that. So we're both doing a lot of electronic music here in, uh, in, in Raleigh, North Cackalack throughout the mid-90s. Um, and as I started using the computer to make music, uh, I found out we could start controlling a lot more things. So at first it was amazing just to have your software controlling your keyboards, drum machines, and samplers. And then somebody's like, hey, you know, you can get a MIDI to multiplex converter, and now you can turn on these park hand lights, and then, you know, or rope lights or something like that. And the next thing you know, I'm orchestrating light shows to go with the, the synthesizer and the dance music that I'm making. Then I got interested in video. So, you know, Around mid to late 90s is when programs like Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, um, After Effects and Premiere, uh, Kai's Power Goo, Bryce 3D, uh, Poser, Cinema 4D started really, you know, kind of coming to their own and we started, started making interesting video clips to play along with the music that we were making and we'd play those through old VCRs and monochrome, you know, green uh, and black phosphorus monitors which you could find anywhere super cheap because tons of companies were dumping these old monitors. And after playing pre-made video clips for a while, I really got the, the desire to, well, what can we do live? And that's where uh, Lev email list comes up. I found that, the live experimental video, which drew me to the first program I ever used called Imagine, uh, shown on the left side there with the color bars. And that was by Tom DeMeyer. And that allowed you to take a video in or still images and manipulate them, uh, apply oscillators to them, modulate them, and control them with MIDI. And then that got me down the path of using programs like Grid Pro, uh, and ultimately I landed on Garage Cube's Modulate for the longest time. So as I was making electronic music and dance music, I was trying to find a way that the computer could help control and play back and generate the visuals. Yeah, so, um, you know, once, once we started getting together and working on some of this stuff, you know, we, we started going through a lot of different programs. I want to preface this with saying that all of these programs are great, and uh, I still use them today. Um, you know, we we just you know you'll see when we talk about our motivations later. Um, you know where where we felt like we struggled a little bit in live performance, and I'll go through some of those things now. now. Like you know with modulate, um, very powerful. Um, James did a lot of scripting in Python to do visuals and stuff in it, but a lot of the time, you know, in that case, Python was a little underperformant you know, for doing anything super complex. And, and so the way that the event system worked with that, you know, we, we really struggled to do a lot of um, generation types things, but we did use a lot of Pete's plugins, the intrinsic effects plugins. And then when I got into VDMX, which I got pretty deep into and anyone that was at KnobCon, um, when we performed the first time, we were using VDMX with um, our prototype structure. 
Um, I, I fed some Quartz Composer and Vuo into that and got into the free frame plugins. And, you know, VDMX, I still use it and it's very powerful. But, you know, the, the thing you run into is if you want to get a lot of variety quickly out of it, you know, you, you, you're just kind of exploring the space. You know, it takes a lot of work to build up all your patches and everything that's going to go on there since it's so powerful. And for our performances, keeping track of how everything was laid out, I'd have tablets full of this button does that, and yeah, it would it would start to get lost, and I couldn't pull up a preset, you know, from six months ago and remember what it did. And so, you know, we did a little work with Resolume, and then you know, I spent a lot of time with Max MSP Jitter because I wrote some VJ software for mu mixing music videos with that, um, and. While it's super powerful, it, again, we suffered from the problem that, you know, to generate some random stuff quickly so we could, you know, just get inspiration for things that we didn't think of, it, it became a little difficult um, to do that. So, you know, looking at our motivations, you know, we felt that the computer visuals looked fantastic. Um, but we noticed when we put together sets for doing stuff, they would get static um, because we'd start using the things that we already had and it would take so long to generate a lot of new stuff and there was no focus on randomization and we wanted something with with some tactile control built into the system you know that that was designed for it already instead of always um, you know taking some kind of MIDI controller with a bunch of tape and uh, and hooking stuff up you know and and having to put a bunch of labels all across you know the MIDI keyboard or what what have you um, we got into looking at analog modular at uh, Moogfest 2016. Uh, Maleko had brought an LZX system and they didn't have a display for it. Someone had brought a monitor that was VGA only <laughs> and they didn't have any way to hook it up. So they asked us if we could showcase it on our table and we were like, oh yeah, definitely. Cause it gives us a chance to play with all these. This, this was the LZX case. This was a unicorn to me because after doing the digital video for so long, I'm like, it's now down to clips. You can download a bunch of clips. You can spend a lot of time making clips, but but generating clips. And so I had heard of LZX, and to have this be set down at our table uh, was absolutely amazing. Yeah, and I think it was uh, Paul Guetta from uh, from Moog came over and started hooking stuff up to up uh, for us because you know we didn't you know have any experience with this. Although we had tons of experience on the audio side since I already had audio modules that that were uh, in production. Um, so. You know, in, in working with analog, what we noticed is a lot of people were using VCRs or cameras for input, and there weren't a lot of other sources. I mean, you know, some people were using computers as well. Um, but, you know, in our look of what other people were doing, you know, we felt that we wanted to, you know, expand on the generation side of it to give, you know, people, let's think of it almost as like wavetable synthesis in a way to, to have even in their analog systems. And given that LZX has done such amazing work in this space, that we knew immediately that that we wanted to work within the LZX space um, with whatever we did, so that people could get the benefits of both worlds, and then we could bridge to you know people that didn't have LZX as well. Right, and I, I mean I think also some of it, as you see, and you know, we felt L LZX Industries was you know taking what used to be large rooms of, of you know academic institutions worth of visual processors and effect and brought them down into the Eurorack uh, world. You know, we thought you know one of the next evolutions of video was when we started getting video out of you know eight bit computers and you know title generators and, and how that slowly was building up. And we thought you know that maybe we could find a spot in in that space uh, to work with LZX. Yeah, definitely. So as we got started, the first thing was um, Raspberry Pi. Uh, I forget if we started with the 2B. Two, two the 2B. Um, and uh, the first experimentation that went on is, is James started working with the frame buffer um, and writing to it specifically. And, uh, you know, it, it was slow. Um, and at that time, we weren't experimenting with any acceleration. And you can see on the top right was one of James's <laughs> screen caps uh, for some of the stuff that he did. So I got in a little deeper with the Neon Core, um, which is a symmetric multiprocessor um, subsystem on the ARM core in the Raspberry Pi, where you can do basically parallel processing. So, you know, if you want to do uh, 8 or 16 or, or 32 multiplies at the same time, then, you know, th that's what we wanted to see what the speed up was there. And, and it did speed it up, but we felt like it for for the type and level of stuff that we want to do it just didn't go far enough and also um, all of the neon code had to be written in assembly uh, which I had figured out and and that really wasn't a lot of fun 
for you know trying to think of a large system. So we decided to to put that on the shelf for yeah. for then. Uh, the next thing was uh, Open Frameworks. Uh, we downloaded and got it got compiled. The big thing about Open Frameworks that had drawn us to it originally was that you know it's cross platform the code base, and so I had gotten it running on OSX as well. The problem that we had is on the Raspberry Pi, it is very heavy on system load. Um, doing some benchmarks on some of the things that you can do on it, it had a lot of um, you know overhead, and so we we still wanted to dig a little deeper. So then we found PyCam demo, which was a, uh, a code demo that somebody had released. Um, and it introdu introduced us to um, direct access to the OpenGL, uh, GLSL pipeline, pipeline and the uh, Discman X subsystem, which meant that we didn't have to use any X windows um, on there. We could write directly to the frame buffer. It also had the, the Pi camera integration into it. And then James spent a bunch of time getting V for L to work, which allowed us to hook up web cameras into it, which was very neat. We actually ran, I think we bought like maybe eight or 10 different web cameras <laughs> to test. Uh, and, and the disappointing part is that, you know, the decoding of the, um, of the video signal, it doesn't come out RGB and it had to happen on the CPU side uh, with, with how that was set up. Um, uh, since then, I've written stuff to decode it on, you know, as a shader. But at the time, even even the throughput through USB, it really ate away at how much CPU time we had to do for other things, uh, which which we wanted to push on. Right. Which and, and this this slide here, you can kind of see uh, one of the reasons, one of the, the, the fundamental, um, what do I want to say, methodologies of structure is we, we keep trying something until we get the results we want and then we see what else we can do with it. So there's a lot of, you know, we, we tried other other libraries like processing and some, you know, homebrew libraries and some 8-bit libraries uh, to do graphics with before we kind of landed on the PyCam demo. But every time it's like, well, what more can we do with this? Yeah, and, and on the bottom right is the dev kit that James <laughs> built. It was steam powered. That, that he would bring like when he was, uh, you know. Traveling for work. Uh, I, I would sit in the hotel room and video capture that into my laptop and then work on more structures because one of the big, uh, sorry, more generators, uh, because one of the big pushes we wanted to do was to have 500, over 500 GLSL generation shaders to start so that the moment you got structure and put it down, it could start doing things, for, you know, right away. So once, once we decided that we kind of liked where this path was going, we wanted to make sure that the, the Pi was the right platform that we wanted to go with. So we started testing some other uh, technologies that are out there. Um, yeah, you'd think that the cameras would give you RGB, but most of them are YCRCB um, in, that we tested. Uh, we tested a, a lot. Like I said, I bought 10 different ones and, and definitely was we were surprised at that as well. Um, and, and side note, I think the best camera that we had was the ra the is the PlayStation Three I camera. Yeah, the PlayStation Three I cam. You can still get them like five dollars. Uh, fantastic camera, and we really had a lot of fun with that. Um, but that but not all, quite there on the frame rate. Yeah, and we definitely struggled with that. So um, so on the platforms, we decided to try out a bunch of different ones just to see you know things we try. We were looking, you know, we wanted to make this cost effective as well. <laughs> So with the Pi, great community support, um, hardware longevity, uh, you know, the, the Raspberry Pi Foundation lists out um, how long that they're going to keep making whatever particular uh, module that you're looking at. Uh, the con on that was there was no native video in and limited RAM, obviously. Um, so the next thing we looked at was this platform called Udu that was based on the NXP uh, IMX chips. This was the Solo 6. Uh, it had video in, but the GL performance was really poor and the and the community support we just weren't happy with. And we also picked up a Tiny Rex, which was a little bit more powerful uh, than the MX6 Solo, but um, we the GPU performance looked questionable um, in our in our looks on that, and it was much more expensive. So you know we we felt that the Raspberry Pi was still the winner there. Um, we even did look at x86 based uh, mini boards as well because uh, the powerful the the hardware was really powerful but most of the boards were much bigger um, than the footprint we wanted 
and it looked like the cost was going to be higher overall with the GPU performance we want. And the worst thing was the current draw. Mm -hmm. We really wanted to make sure we didn't have a module that, that took up all the power in your case, um, which is very easy to do with, with stuff that <laughs> runs at this, this top speed. So we settled on the Pi and we decided to start gauging interest on the concept that we had come up with. So we brought this to um, three different festivals, KnobCon, MoogFest, and Machines and Music. And, um, you know, a favorite quote is uh, Michael Stipe. Uh, we met at MoogFest 2017, and that's exactly his words when James was uh, showing him how it worked. Right, and, and remember, we're there, you know, as erogenous tones for all of the Eurorack audio, mo uh, the Eurorack modules, uh, like, like Blip and Radar and Gatestorm. Um, and Rick had always, you know, as we had been working on the visual stuff, uh, I always had space to set up a visual station next to his. And we were really impressed with how many people uh, were interested in getting video or how many, how many uh, you know, collections of people, bands or, or partners were like, well, I do all the audio, but, you know, my partner is, is a visual artist. And uh, we, we, we made uh, a lot of friends and, and a lot of connections with people who were, you know, seeing this and, and we were able to kind of network them. So as we were going to these shows to show the erogenous tones modules, you know, we were also getting a lot of great feedback and learning so much about video stuff. I mean, half dozen of the people on scan lines I've, I've definitely met through these and you know the various online facebook communities and that's where we got a lot of our ideas yeah definitely and uh you know even like kids coming up and playing with the camera and us going through at this time the code base was basically a pi cam demo um where we started hacking it up adding more effects um that you could run video through some simple 2d type uh generation things because you know we were experimenting at this time and james had a little uh um numeric keypad hooked up with a little key so that that people could uh you know play with it and, and kind of change things on it randomize which is one thing I, I love when i see some of the other raspberry pi projects out there people using the numeric keypad i'm like yeah i remember that that step in our uh when i say in our creation and that's also why we have the the four by four button of grids underneath the display uh like how i was setting off presets earlier which is to you know sort of emulate that grid for being able to do certain things so on our uh, trip back from uh, Machines and Music 2016, uh, you know, it was a nine hour drive back to North Carolina. And yes, my, uh, Stipe really did say that. <laughs> uh, we began, you know, really discussing what we thought a product would look like. Um, so on the left, James took a whole bunch of notes and started drawing some pictures. Uh, that's based off of the Lego computer, by the way, module. And uh, uh, on the right is, you know, uh, I'm an engineer by day, so you can see I started block diagramming all the concepts that I, I started coming up with. And this, this, it, I'll even say at this time, it was a bit of a different system that we were conceptualizing um, because we really weren't fully sure how we wanted to integrate this in, you know, to, to uh, video production as, you know, as, as a whole. Um, so this was very early. So at about this time, I wrote Lars at LZX and, and started our friendship. And uh, this was, we have probably sent thousands and thousands <laughs> of words to each other um, about visuals in general and, and things in the future. And, uh, you know, I, I put one of our conversations on here because this, this is how structure as I started telling Lars what we were thinking about doing, Lars started telling us what he thought was some good ideas. And this was the module design. You know, a lot of times I will uh, just go inside of Illustrator and start mocking up, uh, you know, concepts because I want to see what it's going to look like from a usability standpoint. So with this, this started out just talking about a black and white one volt output that was just generating 3D shapes, maybe with some gradients in the background, uh, and that had all these CV inputs to, to modify position, scale, rotation, et cetera. So, you know, this, this is the very first concept of where structure started. And like all things, it was like, okay, let's start iterating on concepts. So you can see, you know, the second one over, I was like, well, I want some kind of, uh, Let's, let's switch it to CV so we're not locked into these specific functions and let's have, 
you know, control scaling of that and everything else is kind of the same there. And then over from that, I'm like, okay, well, let's move the buttons around a little bit and, and uh, change some things up. And then by the fourth one, you know, <laughs> we had uh, <laughs> offset controls and then you'll see the one volt switches in the middle because I decided I want to make this usable for Eurorack audio or video people, um, you know, as we go. And, you know, uh, yes, feature creep was definitely... <laughs> no, we, just, we just hadn't met the final boss of structure yet. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, engineers are... We <laughs> suffer from feature creep because we're just like, oh, one more thing, one more thing. <laughs> I have to have it all. So, um, so, yeah. So, at this point, I was like, well, let's build a prototype. And, uh, you know, no, that's not the first prototype. This was actually the very first thing I... I put together for the very first Eurorack module that I was designing. Um, and uh, yeah, it did generate signals that worked in Eurorack, but uh, we'll, we won't talk about this design anymore because it didn't go anywhere from after that. But this is just to show you that it, it you know, even as an engineer with many years, it, it starts pretty basic when you start getting into this stuff. So, you know, the next step was designing our first prototype. So here you can see um, the bottom two pictures were the uh, the dip trace uh, uh, graphics of the main board. Um, we switched to using the Raspberry Pi compute module because we wanted something you know that was designed to just plug into a backplane that we had for the rest of everything we designed. There was no video in or um, of uh, composite or RGB on this one, even though you know I had put in those spaces on the, the top of the UI. Um, all of the layers were hard coded in how it worked. It was very, the code was very unfriendly, non-modular to be sure. And in the bottom right, you can see uh, we performed at Machines and Music 2017 visuals for the artists, uh, a couple of the artists that were going on. And we have two of the prototypes there down in the bottom right that we were working with. So, you know, the, the overall response from everyone on this was very positive. They were really interested to see where this was going. And that, and that was a lot from people who were using LZX um, and uh, as well as people who, who were doing more like, you know, just camera and television uh, mix, video mixer, you know, v, using V4s, WMX mixers, uh, you know, colorizers and things like that. So, so from that point, I started getting a lot deeper into, let's look at what the video in and out is going to be. So on the top right, you can see that was actually the video in out um, diagram that I came up with. Uh, spent a lot of time talking with uh, Lars about this. Um, had a lot of problems getting Lattice FPGA communicating with the Raspberry Pi um, ARM chip and uh, spent time with Lattice trying to get that to work. and. Uh, a couple of members of the Raspberry Pi Foundation and just could not get that to work um, and looked at some of the other options that were out there with Xilinx and everything. And ultimately what we ended up on is that, you know, the cost and power required to, to put the RGB out on uh, structure just didn't seem worth it to the end user. Uh, power alone. And so after talking with Lars quite a bit and going over the features of the uh, TBC2, which is the time-based corrector. This is basically two of what we were generating, which is you know being able to take uh, any kind of uh, RCA signal, or sorry, uh, uh, RGB si RCA signal and generate RGB out of it, yeah. so that you could use it in uh, the rest of LZX. So we felt that that was the the ultimately best way to go, and so made that decision. Um, uh, to cut costs and everything uh, by doing that. And, and we think that was absolutely one of the best yeah. decisions that we made just because, you know, there's a lot of people that are going to use Structure 2 that, that, you know, they might not be into uh, analog synthesis. So we wanted to make sure that we weren't charging people more than, than everything that they needed. But if they wanted to go that path, what they needed yeah, was, there was out there. Yeah, there was an alternative. Yeah, so when we had that information, not having the RGB out uh, system you know, re really sped up for uh, development and when we were ready to release. Yeah, and that center picture in the bottom, I just wanted to show, you know, when we're doing stuff with high sp high speed video, there's a lot of physical things that we have to deal with um, in layout to make sure that, you know, the performance is gonna be correct. And, and what you see there- The signals and the timing are happening. Yeah, and those, those are the CSI signals um, coming in uh, from the video chip that we use for the input going into the Raspberry Pi compute module. So once we decided that, the next step was we started 
uh, refining, you know, the interface. Um, and the top left is the one, you know, was from the, the first prototype. You can see on all these, the RGB uh, out is still there. I, we hadn't, when we were doing this, we hadn't made that full decision yet. Um, but you can see at the top right, I decided to add a little preview screen on the right. And then finally, by the last one, James is like, why do you keep this OLED on here? What is it giving us that we're not going to get from the other screen? And I was like, yeah, you're right. Uh, well, and, and, ha and having the screen, because I'm sure this has never happened to any other video artist out there, but sometimes we were placed where we couldn't necessarily see the final output, so we needed a way to monitor this. And that was my big drive to say is that if we had the screen, we could always see what structure was going to be outputting, um, and then that would give us more of a, a, an in-depth menu system where we could really start to bring together all of the things we liked about the software that we had been previously using. Um, and all of the techniques that we wanted to use while we were performing that we'd be able to uh, to have all of that in front of us and not have to memorize anything yeah definitely and, and one thing you can't see from this picture but it um on the first prototype there was only one i think cvbs out and james is one of his good ideas was to uh add two on there so that you know you if you want to do like a some kind of feedback loop and still have it feeding out and not have to have another you know piece of gear to duplicate your signals mm -hmm. Um, and, and even that bottom right one wasn't the finished one. You, you notice that it doesn't have the four by four grid yet. Um, but you know, we did constantly refining these these interfaces. Right. As we I think on. we had to move the SD card yeah. as well, and that and that that that, that changed the, the final design. So you know, with with this new change to the bigger display, um, we we had to start thinking about what we wanted to show on that display. So on the bottom left, what you can see is originally. You know, what we were going to do is have a headless system that you had to hook up to it with a web browser and that you would have a Node.js something, uh, you know, that you would hook into and configure how things were. And believe me, this was very early on. And we, I think this is when we were just going to do a Raspberry Pi project and, and just give it to people. But we felt like that's not really going to work well for live performance, you know, having to go have a web browser hooked up, have another piece of gear hooked up to it, a computer. You know, and, and, and making sure that net connect, network connectivity is working, which I don't know about you all, but I have just struggled with networks and live performances, especially with like OSC, Network, yeah. you know, or, or Bluetooth even in live oh, sometimes. Yeah. It's like, so, so we put everything a, a, as much as we could on the box. So when we have a box like that, and we're still not entirely sure everything that structure is doing, we, we, how, how do you develop an interface? Yeah, so, you know, so that's why, you know, we moved away from that into what you see on the on the right. The bottom uh, right one is the first one I had conceptualized with, uh, you know, we knew we were gonna do nodes all along, but I started thinking about how we could show a signal flow so people could see what was going on. And then James started uh, inside of Illustrator and that's just one of the pages of probably like 16 or 24 different mockups that you did to just kind of get us looking at what we wanted to do uh, what, what do we want to see and then you know how can we build that in like you know making sure we had like a preview of what was happening rather than just plain text on a screen yeah. things like that um, and then how were we going to configure the back end things like the uh, the GLSL uh, shaders you know how are we going to specify what these controls mean yep yep definitely so then became the second prototype which Aww. you know still had the RGB out on there um, but you know at this time we were spending a lot of effort uh, on the code base. Um, video in was now working. Uh, the code was completely rewritten and it was about 85% complete at this point. Uh, there were still a bunch of changes that we were making, but at this point we were getting ready to build the final prototype and um, and just uh, get get more input from people and making sure we liked what was going on. Right, get, um, to, that, get to that beta hardware and get it out on people. Yeah, we're I, gonna use this hardcore, which hopefully some of y'all are out there checking this out. I will say that you know during this time we also um, had to deal with uh, the uh, USB in uh, had a whole bunch of problems so I ended up having to uh, work with uh, people at Raspberry Pi Foundation um, they they had some bugs in there so I was able to give them some feedback of what was causing crashes on USB switching um, and then the other difficult thing was the video in chip uh, we had to change the kernel. Um, to work with uh, a lot of you if you're tuning in and you're doing stuff with the Raspberry Pi there is support for a bunch of different chips um, it built into the, um, the the kernel but some of the variants of those chips they don't all work and so we had to work um, in getting those 
uh, working. The biggest problem there um, is that Broadcom doesn't allow you to get the details uh, for working with the MIP, the, the MIPI interfaces, which is CSI and DSI. And so, you know, we have to have them help us add the changes for timings that we need. And so that was a little painful on getting that working. When you work with the engineer, that, that's what you'll end up finding, these, <laughs> these edge cases, these, oh, and, and the graphics card doesn't work like this in this one particular situation. So again, as every constant iteration, every update in the software that we're doing, every time we're trying to push the envelope a little bit further, because it's just, it's fun. It's interesting to us to see how much can we get out of this. And as Rick mentioned, you know, earlier about the demo scene, a lot of the demo scene uh, being as a visual inspiration or these these audio visualizers were how much you know how far could you push this limited set of hardware so you know on a raspberry pi 3b compute module how much can we make it do yeah so so after getting through all that and making all those changes that led us to the final interface um you can see on the bottom left was the second to last where i had like thought about putting boxes around things um which ended up changing out um and uh, one thing I wanted to mention, uh, a lot of people ask us about the panels that we designed. They thought they were metal. They're mm -hmm. not. They're, they're acrylic. I bought a laser, a uh, cheap laser from China that I cut these with, and it's basically two layer thick uh, with black underneath. So you just etch into it with the laser and it ends up making it look like a metal panel. And so, you know, this was really cool for being able to prototype what it was going to look like, obviously with no colors. Mm -hmm. um, and the final and one kind of hard colors. to read text a little bit. Because you had to do the tiny font. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't always clean. The raster, rasterization on uh, laser isn't always the best, especially one that costs as much as, as mine did. <laughs> you need a really expensive one to get to get better that control kind of, of the, the laser. Yeah. So on the bottom right was our Moogfest, uh, the last one we did with the prototype. Um, and you can see, or maybe that was the second last one. Second to the last one. That was 2018 because we were facing the other yeah, way with that's the projector. Right. Yep. There we just wanted to flex that well, we, we had four we, Commodore 64 monitors. We had the final one at 2019. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. We, that was that was a release. Yeah, the, just the prototype is acrylic, not the one that you have, Ed. <laughs> so we just wanted to talk a little bit about the stats um, of, of, you know, and, and some of the things that we ran into this that were first for us. So, you know, um, there was... Uh, three years from conceptualization of this until we were shipping. Right now we have 94,000 lines of custom C and C++ code. So this is, you know, not, not including any of the libraries or anything we're using. Right now we're at, uh, you know, 1,916 different shaders, uh, a lot of custom written, a lot of public domain. Um, we've got 183 3D objects that my brother, uh, Chris Burnett did. Uh, he, he's been working with us on structure and you've probably seen him at some of the shows with us. Uh, he works in the game industry um, as tech design, uh, technical artist, sorry. And, um, <laughs> you know, we, we definitely uh, utilize his skill set um, in, in getting a lot of different 3D and, and UV mapping and all that. Uh, so if you ever have any questions on that kind of stuff, uh, he's, he is definitely available to answer those kind of things, especially if you're doing your own uh, 3D objects. Right. And on the site, on our YouTube channel, we have uh, Chris's uh, demonstration on how to use Blender 3D to create shapes and, 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 and get the texture orientation correct Yeah. Uh, to, to import into structure, which can handle a, a reasonably sized 3D object, you know, nothing full 3D world sort of thing. You can kind of tell with what we demonstrate, you know, what it can handle. Yeah, on definitely. Um, we ended up building six full prototypes to do this and three additional host interface boards, which is the board in the back that hooks up to the Pi. There's actually, uh, you know, we've got two different of our own circuit boards in the back and then the Pi hooks into the back one. Um, so we went through a lot of those as we were iterating through uh, video in and video out. Um, we did a custom joystick flange. I'd never done uh, any kind of uh, injection molding before. so. Uh, using Fusion 360, designed it up, uh, had it done with a resin printer just to make sure that it looked right, and contacted a company in Florida who made us, uh, I think, a thousand of them. So, you need joystick flanges. Yeah, let us know. <laughs> um, and then our LCD and fan assemblies, we ended up deciding to do with uh, uh, 3D printing with PLA. Both James and I have 3D printers um, because these are inside and. And uh, I'm very impressed with, with 3D technology now, and uh, we're very happy with going uh, through that. And that was fun, just the whole design and, and, and making that at home thing. You know, I had a 3D printer and was printing out skulls from Thingverse and all of that, but it was, re it was really cool to, you know, 
learn all of that process as well. I mean, everything we, we throw into structure is like, hey, this is kind of neat, and how does this fit? Yeah, and I also want to give a shout out to WMD, oh, yeah. um, who, William. William, who does uh, our boards for us and, uh, you know, did a little help on power circuitry and stuff, and, and uh, it was just fantastic working with them. Uh, if you're ever deciding to get into Eurorack building, definitely talk to William. He is, he is just, uh, you know, 100% great guy to work with and all the people at WMD actually. So support wise, you know, this is a community and, and uh, the, the visual community is one of the best communities I've ever worked with. Everyone Absolutely. is so willing to work with each other, share schematics, code, you name it. Technique. You know, I'm on the, uh, the Facebook pages for Reeker Boy, uh, Wave Pool, uh, you know, talk with uh, Ron with Hypno here and there um, because you know we, we all want to see the state of visuals get better um, as time goes on as we have more tools available just so we can push the envelope uh, so you know we have a live editing website so that that uh, we took the GLSL sandbox uh, code base and modified it to work with what structure looks for uh, James did all that work and set it up so that you could do either uh, effects or generators right now um, we plan on adding uh, more in the future, uh, different types of node uh, shaders that you can edit. Um, and and Recur uses the shader format we use too, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, I think I think you converted that so you could do that. So you can you can download these and then put upload them up. You know, you can click on them and from the website and, and put them on. Yeah, definitely. And we like loved having these on there. So you know, because we hope that people that, that develop you know shaders for Recur or or anything else, you know we push it all back and forth and, and everyone gets the benefit for those. And, and I'll just put a plug out there. If you ever do some and you want us to put them in the firmware, just send us the shaders or if you've converted some you don't think we have, uh, we'll put them in there. You know, We like to see all that stuff on there. We, all the ones that we generate for even uh, you know, art projects or whatever, we throw them in there. Um, the latest thing that we added also is that we have a user guide for WordPress. Um, that this is something- uh, We finally got up. Yeah, we're using <laughs> WeDocs. Um, if you're a user and you see anything that's missing, let us know. But we want to do living documentation because you know we work on structure quite a bit. Uh, you know that this is our passion on 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 uh, you know creativity. Only second to graphic design. Right. <laughs> yeah. So so you know we love hearing from you all. Um, and then you know just a, just a side note for any of you developers, uh, we like to use GitLab for doing all our our uh, code. And we do have a bug area that um, I believe we've sent out to the list if people are having any problems. Um, they can submit a bug report and, and we go through there and, um, and we'll fix those and roll those out. <gasps> so looking into the future. So, um, you know, we want to quickly talk about uh, where structure's going. We're constantly adding new features. Um, we just oh, and we're going to mention that here in a second too. We're yeah. going to preview a little something. So y'all didn't wait in vain. Um, so we're still working on the MIDI system. Uh, the big thing now is adding uh, a high resolution MIDI. We do have a Suite 16 and a VCMC, uh, I believe that's the name of it, um, uh, that, that both do high resolution MIDI. Um, and uh, we're gonna get that in as soon as possible. We're also working at a, a, what I call a numerical filtering system. And that's basically allowing CVs to, that are coming in to be manipulated into different CV um, CVs based on that. So you can get variety even off you know, you have CV. one CV coming in and having it do different things, you know, like invert them and stuff like that. So, so that will be coming. And the last big thing that I think a lot of people uh, are curious about is the Pi 4 compute module. So uh, Raspberry Pi completely changed the form factor of the compute. They removed the second SD card off the back. They removed the, um, the display man X uh, interface to the frame buffer. So, all that means is it's a little bit more work for us to figure out how we're going to adapt this. We're, we're going to make a new backboard on the back. Uh, we're going to have an upgrade kit for it so that you'll be able to, to use that. I mean, the Pi will come with it, I believe, because we're going to have to program the EMMC memory that's built into it, which the good part is will be a lot faster than the Raspberry Pi um, SD card yeah, interface now. Um, I am going to look at using MVME. Um, which is basically just uh, uh, you know hard drive, uh, NAND based uh, SSD, um, and see if we can use that in addition or replace the EMMC 
Um, so we're still looking at that. Um, mm -hmm. if, if we can make it so that you could figure out how to plug one into it um, and, and put your video stuff on there a little quicker, that, that'd be something really neat. Yeah. But just, just want to let you we, know. Yeah. We have a, we, we, we're aware and we're looking at it and seeing what we can do and what changes we might need to make yeah. to, to what we have to incorporate this. Because there are a lot of exciting things with the Pi 4. Um, but there are also a lot of things we still need to figure out. Yeah, and you know, one thing I, we recognize the cost differences on the different RAM versions. So, um, you know, it will work with all the different ones in case you're someone that doesn't do a lot of video, so you don't want the high high RAM one. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, just to know that you know we, we're going to be working on that. So that so that's where the future is uh, right now uh, on structure, and so. The, the last thing that we wanted to show you is the new node that is coming. Um, oh yeah, one thing, the reason we want to upgrade is because we want to be able to get the new uh, GL pipeline that's in there. Right, which will be GLES 3.0 rather than uh, 2.1. That'll give us access to a lot of things um, and a lot more RAM to work with. So we might be able to start getting some things in like uh, the, uh, the, the rendering and the yeah, you're uh, ray tracing, ray tracing, stuff, thank you. stuff like that. You know, it, that's why that's the push. We are still going to support the old Pi three, right? Um, but but yeah, the plan all along was to do an upgrade kit. We were hoping just to be able to take the Pi four and hook it right in. That's why we right. we did the compute module the way we did. But yeah, we don't want you to have to buy a whole new front and all that because all that stuff works perfectly well. So, you know, we're going to make it very reasonable. Okay, so the the last big thing we wanted to show is the new node we've been working on that we've been uh, talking about, uh, you know, and not actually saying anything mm -hmm. about it. So, uh, you know, it, it's still in development, but um, we're going to have we're James very be demonstrating okay. it. So I'm right. um, just going to talk about it first real quick, um, is that it's a 2D node. It's uh, Python-based. It uses Cairo uh, and some custom extensions I wrote for uh, Python. Um, it, it, it has uh, MIDI input, so like if, you're, if you have a MIDI keyboard or you're driving MIDI with notes, it recognizes those notes and quantizes those notes into 12 different um, uh, drivers. And you can, you'll be able to do um, just really neat visual things with those notes doing things. It also listens to the, uh, the nine bands of the FFT. So things will be able to, to uh, modulate different 2D things going off of FFT. And of course, it can either listen to the you know the normal CVs that come in, or um, you'll be able to just listen to all all of the CVs. It also has a random mode that will generate random MIDI or FFT, um, just so if you don't have anything plugged in but you like what those those programs look like, you'll be able to use those um, as well. I am also looking at building a designer for Win OS X so that you can conceptualize these Python programs uh, on your computer before you load them on the front SD card, um, just because that makes everything easier. And right now we're looking at a release date in uh, December. Like most things, you know, we probably won't have 100% of everything running on it, but it will do most of it, uh, mainly just so we can get it out there and you guys can start playing with it. So let me go ahead and switch over to Structure to this view hand, uh, so right james can go over to 2D. so so we'll, we'll go over to 2d here real quick and um let's see here what we're doing right now uh we are drawing these little uh little eight bit tiles this little two color eight bit tiles um all of these uh the data is just listed into an array in this particular in a particular um 2d shape uh 2d Generator, yep. I guess, and um, and then and then we're drawing those out, and we have uh, abilities to force them on a grid, not force them on a grid, um, modify their size, modify their speed, um, and and basically here, what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to go ahead and just start hitting random because Rick and I have worked out about a dozen or so or two uh, generator shaders to kind of give you an idea of some of the things that we've got going here. And the neat thing about using Python as the back end is that we can we can keep arrays of of objects, you know, which is a little bit easier to do than in GLSL. So that we 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 get the ability to uh, let's see here. Oh, that's the uh, that's in his tone. We got the joystick drawing circles, different lines, um, and it, it's a node. So there's 2D. Uh, here's 2D with two different effects on it. And have a uh, one too far. Yeah, this one, there's a lot of feedback built into some of these because it works really well. Like this one, oh, yeah, kind of like the Death Star approach. 
Let's see here. I'm gonna walk you guys. So this one, actually, you know what? I have some modulators uh, going from the Batumi, so I'll just have those go into the, the CV input. A uh, little color tunnel. Then we'll just random through a few more squares. Here we're just bouncing some balls and drawing lines to them. Uh, using sizes and circles. I saw those. <laughs> yeah, this I, I took a, um, a uh, maze generator, and then I wrote a, uh, you know, always go left, left wall, um, just to see, you know, what it would do. And again, you know, really pushing, uh, you know, the boundary of all the different things that, that you can do with, uh, you know, 2D. I'll say that the big thing with 2D compared to GLSL, um, you know, if you had tuned into um, some of the other talks, um, the big problem with GLSL uh, is, you know, you're you're doing all the frame at once. Every pixel is is in parallel, basically. They don't know anything about the other pixels, um, especially with GLSL 2.0, uh, where it can't look at its neighbors even. Um, there's some functions for that in the GLSL language. Um, so it's the only way to get feedback of information from frame to frame if it's generated in the frame is to write out to a texture and then read that texture um, uh, right back in. Oh, there's Game of Life. Oh, yeah, that's for Ed. You mentioned this yesterday, but I didn't want to spoil the surprise. Yeah, I did. I did uh, converted the Game of Life into this as well. Um, so so you can do a lot of history with with this and you can have objects and stuff that that, um, you know, you can do things with over time. As James gets to some of the other, um, some okay. of the other, I don't even remember. Oh yeah, that one. There, uh, faking in notes. Yeah, and you can see it's just it's really fun for being able to generate things. Um, I'm probably modulating some of this. Yeah. Strangely. Oh yeah, this one. <laughs> this is inspired by the Lego computer. Um, I couldn't resist. Uh, I just wanted to see what doing a little fake little UI look like. Um, you know, and, and all these will be available to play around with. Uh, did the a fire algorithm, if you ever looked at, this is very demo scene, um, and I'm tilting it back and forth a little bit so that you can get some uh, different uh, effects of like the flame coming back and forth. Which is cool. Uh, how are we on time? Oh, we're good right okay. now. Uh, did some pipes, you know, with uh, Cause, zoom forward. Because the 90s. There's my tiles. I didn't see asteroids come up. Oh, I might have messed up on the order I was randoming through them. Oh, and we didn't see the sketch one yet. Oh, right, right. We'll get through some yeah. of these. Some of these. So these are some of the circular ones I've done in dashed lines and, and bubbles and messing around with ideas, basic grid. Uh, there's, my, there's my hardcore hacker, which yeah. we can even uh, change, put colors in there. We can change our, our font size, or you know, we could be modulating all of this. Let's see. We'll keep moving. Uh, prototype yep. lines and dots yes I, we've stared at a lot of screensaver <laughs> and just oh uh, yeah oh, that's funny that, this one's always good yeah let's just make it like growing normal so this one is just drawing it's like how do you how do you draw like a, a square inside of a circle or an octagon or a pentagon or a whatever so it picks a random number of shapes between two and eight and then it depends on how many sides they have and then it just kind of keeps growing them and again as we you know we've noted their um their nodes so we can we can run them through other things we can run them through our dual effects we'll be able to map those on to uh 3d objects uh, another one this one works best with incoming yeah, we do a lot of tests with CV and stuff too, just to make sure. Uh -huh, squares, tunnels of Armageddon. A shout out if y'all like uh, '80s, '90s computer games. Uh, more letters. Yeah. yeah, I started conceptualizing doing a Wolfenstein 3D. Uh, here's a, a lightning. If you recognize any of you Gatestorm users, this is uh, the algorithm from Gatestorm. I converted it over uh, and uh, extended it. Mm -hmm. um, just basic little fractal. I saw the map. Uh, spinning circles. Different sizes. A different there's type a, of that. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, this one This one I really enjoyed doing. So uh, I put a texture in the background, um, and figure out how to load up a PNG, and then you can see the way that I'm doing the drawing. I'm using a gradient, uh, so it looks like a marker. 
Um, so and it has slight translucent. So and I just generated an algorithm uh, to just generate random curves and stuff like that. So really fun on that one. That one, you know, when we stretch it. <gasps> dislodge the uh the hole oh and yeah there's there it is. asteroids yeah so i created like some kind of like asteroids um and anytime they collide and get to a smaller size they 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 destroy but this kind of shows you the whole concept of like keeping track of items between frames and then you know doing stuff with them so you know so basically this is the you know the 2d node and, and we're still oh yeah i forgot i even did this one which was just kind of like a walking and building something over time. Oh, I forgot so many of these things that, that we did. Doctor Who. Low resolution Doctor Who. Store brand. There's, yeah, there's more, a Game of Life. Game of and then life. You, did, you did a few... Uh... Yeah, there's a couple of varieties on the Game of Life. This is as well. Yep. So I think that's... Yeah, that's, that's, that's most of them. So and, and we're still developing those, but those will be those will be fun to uh, let me just do what we do. So so one of the things with structure because we usually have so many different um, options and shaders and generators and layouts is I, I keep pressing just a random button here to kind of randomly go through and, and and choose a few things, and that's usually how I look for like a a, a start <laughs> on visuals is just hit random till something kind of clicks, and then uh, and then kind of work it from there. <laughs> yeah, so likely we should see something in December, uh, as, as like I said, the release date on that. Um, so, you know, so if anyone has any uh, questions uh, that we can answer, uh, just through a picture of us uh, being VJs in 2008, staring over a computer. This was with that uh, VJ software I wrote with Max MSP. Never enough options. That's <laughs> engineering me talking. Uh, I always, I also put this poster in here that uh, that Lars did with LZX because it made me so happy to see that they put a poster of all these different, uh, you know, manufacturers at the time making different type of visual modules into into one poster. And then we were included. Yeah, it, it was nice. I think there's brown shoes only on there. And, yeah. uh, Philip, uh, you know, the work that he did on the Castle series right. and all right. that. So. All right, so any questions? Well, now we wait for the questions to come in. I mean, I guess we can put it back on the the visualizer screen, and I can keep messing around for those who aren't. Yeah, um, I'll put some visualizer on there. Let's see here. I will mess around with the mix. Yeah, we didn't show all the different nodes that we have, but, you know, we have, like, a mix node, we have an image node, a clip node, feedback node. Text uh, node text node 3d node and, and a bunch of stuff there. audio effects nodes yeah we you can read audio in and it renders it into frames and then does different stuff with it so you can really explore that and basically like we had said before you know the big thing here is we want to give people stuff uh yeah we should do a undo for the random because I can't tell you the times where I accidentally click it again and I'm like, <laughs> no, I really wanted that one. Um, but but basically, this wasn't is a that, good. Wasn't that last? Uh, does that work on all of them? I uh, so. uh, we'll have to try that. File a bug. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but yeah, anyways, thanks everyone for um, uh, coming to see our talk. And uh, um, mash that like and subscribe. Oh, wait, yeah, no, yeah, wrong yeah, channel. Sorry, like and subscribe. Mind. We really want to thank Ed. And uh, Jake you know, and all the Viticon people, um, all the shows we've seen, all the all the presentations, and some of the performances last night were blow. Oh, there I am. Were blowing me away. This is so great yeah. to see everyone. And it, it's too bad we couldn't be in person this year. Maybe next year. Uh, I'll I'll try to get myself up there uh, and bring a bunch of structures for people to play with. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we think it's the last, but we got to test it because I haven't used it. Pressing random.